I'd like to um, pass over to Renee Walker um, to talk about understanding the process around solving issues with repairs during and post repair, including the review and complaints process. All right, so I'll hand it over to Renee. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so tonight what I'm going to cover is questions that have been put forward to me. And I think with this size group, the um, advantage of having this size is that we can probably have some more one-on-one -on -one discussion rather than me presenting generic information. There's some familiar faces here, so I know that you're already in the process, some of you. So I won't start right from the beginning, but I'll try and cover some of the more common things um, about the repair process. And then if we can spend more time on your questions and answers, I think we'll probably all get more from the presentation. So a number of questions were posed to IAG from the In The Know, and these have come either via their website or via the hub here. So these are the questions that people have been asking, and hopefully they'll help you. But as I say, we can also go to your um, direct questions. So the repair method. Your repair method is designed by an engineer, and I think this is the important thing. So there's a lot of... Um, myth and conversation around insurers coming up with a design method that's not right for the conditions or that's not um, according to a building code. We have to work with engineers and the repair methodology has to meet the current building code. So even if the um, repair doesn't need a consent, we still have to get engineers involved. So we would get an engineer to do what we call a PS1 engineering um, design, which says this is the design that must be taken to fix this damage. And then we'd get a PS4, which is an engineering sign off to say that the repair was done according to what needed to be done. So there's always engineering sign offs at the start and at the end of the repair process. The type of repair recommended by the engineer does vary. So it varies depending on the geotechnical information for your site. So there is site specific geotechnical engineering done and then a structural engineer uses that um, geotechnical engineering to design whatever foundation repair needs to be done if there's a foundation damage and to design the rest of the repair. And your foundation type, so there's A, B and C foundation types, and I'll just touch um, quickly on those. So type A is piles with no ring foundation, type B is piles with a concrete ring foundation, and type C is a concrete slab foundation. So again, the engineer would be recommending to us the repair methodology that's right, depending on the type foundation you have. And I have some information about foundation types and design um, that I'll leave here tonight for you. I'll also put some links to videos up on the In The Know website. So we'll make sure that you have the In The Know details before you leave because there's some really good videos and they're not IAG videos, they're MB videos. So the Ministry of Building, Innovation and Employment. And they show the method for repair to both ring foundations and concrete slab foundations. They're really useful to watch just to get an idea if that's um, going to form part of your repair methodology, just to give you an idea of how that's done. So some of the more common repair types, you may remember a few years ago we started to see a lot of houses up in the air like this one that was in Rolleston. At that point in time, that was one of the most common repair methodologies. And there were advantages and disadvantages of that type of repair, and it's still used today. One of the disadvantages is obviously there's not a whole lot of kit sitting around waiting to lift houses. So there's some time delay, and it is quite invasive. So you can see this house here in the picture. It's up on um, a hydraulic lifting system, but it's braced through the middle of the jib. So it's quite an invasive method. This is a brick house. So to do this, we have to declad the house, put the bars through the middle of the house and then lift it. Now, it is quite quick once it's lifted in the air because you can get in underneath, you can break up the current foundation and lay the new one while it's up in the air. So it's an advantage once you get to that point, but it is quite invasive. There's other methods now that are more common. So there's lifting and roll, and that works if there's a big section. So rather than having to have it up in the air, you can use a less invasive form of um, lift and roll, which we roll the house to another part of the section, repair the foundation, and then roll the house back. And there's also what we're hearing a lot about at the moment, which is the jack and pack. Now the jack and pack is not a new solution, it's been around for a long time, it's just used a lot more now because there's a lot more damaged foundations and as I say one of those videos that we will put up on the website shows the jack and pack, it is worth having a look at it and 
in the jack and pack solution, usually the house can be left in situation and it's a lot less invasive to the home than some of these other methods. Um, the picture down the bottom just shows some of the new foundation types. So obviously there's deep foundations but also shallow foundations and some of those shallow foundations are re-levelable. So if we had another event, God forbid, we could actually use the same foundation to re-level the home from. But the important thing is the solution will be relevant to your home and for each person that's here it will be a different solution because it does depend on the land, it depends on the damage, it depends on the home, it depends how heavy it is, what type of cladding it has, um, what the geotech engineer says the bearing capacity of your land is. So it's really important that we know about your individual property before we start to talk to you about solutions. So that's why in this type of environment, it's probably more um, useful for you to be able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations because for everyone, the solution is going to be slightly different. So the questions that, put, that were put to us from in the know, one of them was what happens if everything in the scope isn't repaired? Now the scope is the point of the process that you are most involved in. So before any repair is undertaken, a scope is done and the builder and your loss adjuster will walk through the home with the scope with you. And that's your opportunity to make sure that you are confident that everything that is earthquake damage is captured in that scope. And then, once the scope is agreed is when your insurer, whether it's us or any other insurer, would cost the damage. So the scope's done first and then the insurer goes away, costs that damage and will then have a conversation with you about whether you cash settle the damage based on that scope or whether you continue with the repair based on that scope. But what you need to be confident about is that all damage is captured in that because that's what will form the next part of the repair. Um, in our process, you have a rebuild solution manager from Hawkins as well if you're going through a managed repair and they will also help you through that process. So what happens if more damage is found during the repair? Again, if you're in a managed program and the repair starts and more damage is found, first of all, we'll look at it to make sure that it is earthquake damaged. And if it is earthquake damaged, it will be added to the scope of work as a variation. Now. This did happen more in the early day of insurer programs because we didn't have such invasive assessment methods. Um, now we have critter cams, so we have cameras that go down and look at foundations. If you have concerns about cavities or anything that we can't see, we will open up walls to look at the damage. So it doesn't happen as much now, but there are often things that people can't see at the time of assessment. If you're through a repaired program, managed program, it's treated as a variation. If you choose to cash settle your claim and manage your own repair, the settlement is generally, and I say generally because it's not always, but generally a full and final settlement. If you have selected to take a full and final cash settlement, then if any other damage is found, the cost escalation and any previously unidentified damage is your responsibility. So. Again, if you are looking to cash settle, you would want to be confident that that cash settlement is adequate for you to move on and you're confident that it does um, capture all of the damage. Repair of historic damage, so non-earthquake damage. And John has a very nice way of putting this, so I'll get him to cover that in the questions and answers. But generally, if it's historic damage, it's not covered by your insurance policy. So your insurance policy responds to earthquake damage and that is what's covered. Um, if pre-existing or historic damage is found during the assessment or the repair process, this is not covered. But what John will cover is, it's again comes down to the individual situation. So if we have to touch something because it's got earthquake damage, then there may be some cover to the historic damage because it's also earthquake damaged. But if part of the house is earthquake damaged and part of it is not, then obviously we're only responding to the part that is earthquake damage. But if there's people with specific concerns about anything around historic damage, again, we can cover those spe specific um, situations. So expected standards, the industry standards that we follow are obviously the building code standards, we work with council, we have to get code of compliance on any repair that we do, so there is that guarantee there for you. Um, the quality control standards, just in terms of what we do throughout a managed repair, we pay the builder at milestones throughout the repair process and at each milestone there is a check by either Hawkins or our loss adjuster to make sure that the work that has been done meets a tradesman-like standard and that tradesman-like standard is the um, guidelines that MB sits, sets down is what we use. 
So who's responsible for making good any bad repairs or what happens when the repair deteriorates over time? Now this is where the IG program is different to some other insurers in that we are not a party to your building contract. So if you do repair through our program, the contract is still directly between yourself and the builder. And what that means is if there's an issue relating to the quality of the work, then in the first instance, we'd be supporting you to raise that with the builder because the builder has the obligation to respond to the bad repair. Um, you, you may have rights under your building contract as well because you're the party to the contract directly with the builder. But that also, the building contract also gives some rights to the builder. So one of those things is that if there is bad repairs, the builder does have the right to come back and remedy those bad repairs. So there's been situations where we've had homeowners who have wanted to kick the builder off because they don't like the quality of repair or the um, relationship may have deteriorated. Actually, under the contract, we have to give the builder the opportunity to go back and repair the work before the builder can just be kicked off. But again, it would depend on the specific situation and it may be that in doing the bad repair, they have um, negated some part of the contract anyway. There may be a way of cancelling the contract, or terminating the contract, but we need to do that before another builder can be put on the job because otherwise we haven't um, fulfilled our obligations or you haven't fulfilled your obligations under the contract to the builder. Um, there's a Consumer Guarantees Act and we'll put the link up on the In The Know website as well in case you do have any issues there that you want to have a look at that Consumer Guarantees Act. What assurance is in place to stop builders or insurers walking off the job? So again, there's a building contract in place so a builder can't just walk off the job and there are obligations that mean that they need to um, manage what they've con been contracted to manage. In the case of a managed rebuild, and I'm just reading into what this question might be getting to and I might be off track, but I thought that maybe it's more around if builders um, go out of business. So as I said, we only pay builders for work once it's been done. So if you're in our managed program and the builder went out of business, we would put a new builder on the job to finish the job. The only um, issue that we may encounter there is if your first builder um, has applied for consent and has put any kind of guarantees to the job because we'd have to work with a new builder to make sure they were comfortable to pick up the consenting um, work that the, exist the first builder had done or any guarantees or anything that were in place. But it's all doable. Um, there is just, it's not as easy as this person works off, walks off on Thursday and this person starts on Friday. There's often some time that the site has to be um, left to work those details out. The complaints process and time frame. So I mentioned this afternoon, this is the official process, but I think that there's often ways of resolving issues before you need to go into an official process. And the reason that I say that is once you're in an official process, there's time frame and timelines and certain ways of doing things that have to be met and it does become quite a formal interaction so generally if there's a complaint and it goes beyond a step one or step two everything becomes in writing and it becomes a little bit depersonalized and I think that often you get better resolution by having a face-to-face -face conversation and working through what the issue is because once you're in a complaints process sometimes the complaint that is read from a letter is actually something completely different to what the issue is and if we have a conversation we work that out and can deal with all of the issues rather than the one that's put down in black and white but this is what I asked about so this is I just wanted to make sure that people have this documented and you know if you ever need to go through the official process so most insurers will follow something similar to this where step one is you have a complaint you um, raise that with the person that you've been dealing directly with so whether that's a case manager or a loss adjuster if you don't get any response from that step one complaint, then you would ask to speak to their team manager and they'll acknowledge that your, your complaint has been received and that is generally in writing so it becomes part of the official process. They investigate and then they inform you of the outcome. If you don't get resolution there, step three is that the complaint will go to a general manager. They'll acknowledge that within three days, three working days, and make sure that it's fully investigated. And then you will receive written advice of the outcome 
within 10 days and if no decision has been made then we'll give you an update within that time period and that update will include what are the next steps and how long will that take. And then finally, step four is if we're unable to um, resolve your complaint within two months, then it's deadlocked and it can go to the insurance and saving on ombudsman. Now, the thing with the insurance and saving on ombudsman is they can only rule on have we done what we're obligated to do under the policy. So that's quite, it's quite a black and white approach as well and it is very much about the policy. So as I say, if it's about my claim's not moving and I need help keeping it moving, you're probably better to address that through a conversation with the right person rather than going through the official process. But the official process is there to support you. Um, questioning a repair. So one of the questions was what evidence is required if customers want to question a repair? We will take into account any independent reports that a homeowner has and these are reviewed alongside any reports that we have. So we have many instances of this where we've got a report or a um, repair methodology and costs associated with that and a homeowner will have their own. We will take both reports into consideration. We'll generally get a QS, a quantity surveyor, to review both those reports. And if you have a report that differs from ours and it changes the outcome of the claim and you've paid to get your own report, then we'll reimburse you for that. So if we have engineering that says one thing, you have an engineer's report that you've paid $5,000 for and actually we, re we read that and say, yep, actually we, we agree with that and we've peer reviewed it and yes, this has gone from a repair to a rebuild or a $300,000 repair to a $500,000 repair, then we will reimburse you for the cost of the report that you have um, got. Uh, cash settlement and ongoing insurance. So this was not one of the questions, but I thought it's just useful for people to be aware of. So as I said earlier, a cash settlement is generally full and final. It's based on what can be assessed and how much it's estimated to cost the cost to be to reinstate the damage at the time the offer is made to you. So that means that once you receive that, your claim is closed and any future um, damage that you find is not covered. The important thing here is if you're looking at cash settlement, you need to have a conversation with your insurer about ongoing insurance. And the reason that I raise that is I think, well, we're seeing a lot of people are cash settling claims without the intention maybe of doing the work straight away, which is fine, and insurance stays in place on a repair until your first renewal or your second renewal if, it's, if your first renewal is within six months. So it's just something to be aware of that if you have a repair, if your house is insured for $500,000 and you cash settle a repair of $200,000, then we would retain cover of $300,000. But if we come back to you at your next renewal or your second renewal and you haven't made any attempt to reinstate the damage, so you haven't talked to a builder or got quotes or anything, then we would review whether we continue to cover the, um, the house. So you, you just need to think about what future intentions are because you don't want to get to the point where you then don't have insurance on the house which might make it harder to sell. And So just be thinking about what your future intention is before you do cash settle so you know all of those options that are available. Uh, so this same kind of thing, if you cash settle on a rebuild, so I've taken it from the approach of a repair because this is what I was asked to speak about with the repair, but some of you may be in that situation that it's a repair or a rebuild or it is a rebuild. Um, if you cash settle on a rebuild, your cover's cancelled at that time. And the reason for that is we've indemnified you for the loss. So if the house is worth $500,000, we've paid you the $500,000, there's nothing there to insure. But as I said, we've retained cover on the repair. Um, if it's a rebuild and you do intend to rebuild, then once you've done that, we will provide insurance again. So we just need to know that a code of compliance certificate has been issued and you just have a conversation with us before you undertook the re rebuild so we could give you that guarantee. Um, in terms of a repair, so if you decide that you're going to self-manage the repair, then for us to reinstate the cover to full cover, so from that $300,000 back to the $500,000, then if a consent was required, we'd require evidence that you had that consent. Um, 
that a code of compliance certificate had been issued. If there was any structural damage, we'd require the scope of works. We'd also want the producer statement, so the PS1 and the PS4 that I mentioned earlier. So the PS1 is, this is the design for the repair methodology. PS4 is the sign off that the repair was done according to that design. And then for cosmetic damage, we'd just require a statement from the tradesperson, receipts. Um, we'd need to know that the work was carried out in a manner compliant with the building code. But I also have fact sheets about that. So if you're thinking about cash settlement, then I just take one of those ongoing fact sheets, ongoing insurance fact sheets away. So while you're thinking about that, or if you're getting any independent advice, you can make sure that whoever you're speaking to knows um, how that would be affected as well.